I believe that is formal business done. I'm not seeing. All right, we will now move to the urgency motion. I'll give people a chance to resume their seats. I inform the Senate that at 8.30 a.m. today, 17 proposals were received in accordance with Standing Order 75. The question of which proposal would be submitted to the Senate was determined by lot. As a result, I inform the Senate that the letter from Senator Urquhart proposing a matter of urgency was chosen. It is shown at item 12 on today's order of business. Is the proposal supported? I understand that informal arrangements have been made to allocate specific times to each of the speakers in today's debate. With the concurrence of the Senate, I shall ask the clerks to set the clocks accordingly. And I call Senator Walsh. Uh, thank you very much, President. And I rise to contribute on the matter of urgency moved uh, by Senator Urquhart. Uh, and we are in a global race, a race to net zero a race to secure the global job opportunities of renewable and low emissions technology and bring them right here to Australia. Uh, we are in a race that, under the Morrison government, uh, we are going to lose. We are going to lose this global race because we have a Prime Minister who always does too little, too late. A Prime Minister who just does not know how to lead and who doesn't have a vision for our country. Not only does this Prime Minister fail to see a bright future for Australia as a renewable superpower, he can't even see the opportunities which have always been right in front of him. We all know that during the 2019 election campaign, Prime Minister Morrison famously now said that electric vehicles will end the weekend. And no matter how many times he tries to deny it now, that is simply what he said. Now, he says electric vehicles are the key building block in the government's net zero plan. Well, two years of missed opportunity to put Australia at the front of the queue to develop an electric vehicle industry. But what can we expect from the government that famously turned its back on the Australian car manufacturing industry? a move which was responsible for the loss of thousands of skilled jobs in this country. Imagine what could have been achieved for this industry and these workers if the government had a plan and if they acted on the opportunities before them. The story for those thousands of skilled workers and small businesses which supported the industry would have been so, so different. But what can we expect from a government who is driven on politics and not on principles? From a government which is only now seeing the advantages of green technologies, even while other countries have been investing in them for decades? What a shambles is this government's climate policy? This government has seen no leadership from its Prime Minister. And as the world moves rapidly towards renewable energy, we have the opportunity for Australia to take the lead. We have the opportunity to become a renewable energy superpower, to generate thousands of new jobs as part of a global green technology revolution, to support our renewable energy to the world, the opportunity to rewire our nation to take advantage of our sun and wind. And what we have right here in Australia right now is the opportunity to rebuild Australian manufacturing. Um, we have the opportunity to do that with cheaper renewable energy to make more of what we need right here in Australia. The world's climate emergency is Australia's jobs opportunity. And Australia needs a government that is up to the task, a government that gives the energy sector the policy certainty that it needs to invest, a government that has a plan to create thousands of good-paying jobs while making power cheaper for our homes and our businesses. Instead, what we have is a government that is absolutely divided on this issue, unable to move forward from outdated and completely inadequate mid-term targets, 
unable to legislate its net zero by 2050 target because it's afraid it won't have the numbers on its own benches to get the job done. We have a government with climate policies which have seen us fall to last place on global climate action. And without a real plan, it is Australian workers who will pay the price. If we do not act fast enough, Australian industries will face international carbon tariffs. And again, it is Australian workers who will pay the price, Australian workers who will face losing their jobs. If we don't act fast enough to seize the opportunities in front of us, workers will miss out. Australia has the most to lose if we act too slowly to respond to the global green economy. But we also have the most to gain if only this government could act right now. Australia is best placed to have a thriving battery manufacturing sector. We can mine the lithium that we need right here in Australia, and we can take that lithium to manufacture batteries for our own electric vehicles. We can build more of what we need right here in this country, if only we have a government that has a plan to act and harness those opportunities. We can do all of that, all while creating good, secure jobs for workers right here in Australia. Jobs on union sites, good, secure jobs, jobs with decent pay and jobs that will last into the future. We can do more than dig things up in this country. We can use these natural advantages that we have of our resources and we can add value right here instead of shipping them off and then just buying them back. But we need the ambition to do it and we need a government with that ambition. We need a government with the leadership to get the job done. And we are falling behind because the Morrison government lacks the ambition and lacks the leadership that we need. We are losing the global race to bring these jobs here to Australia. Australians want a government that has a plan. They want a government that will act right now. And what I'm hearing from people in my home state, uh, in Victoria, is that right now is the time to bring these jobs here. Right now is the time that this global race is on. And the people that I've spoken to overwhelmingly want this government to support new jobs in renewables. They know that this is a once-in-a-generation opportunity to rebuild manufacturing and deliver good, secure jobs. And they don't want Australian workers to miss out. But this government has put forward uh, a plan that is just not a plan. It is just a glossy document that is full of promises and no delivery, uh, not unlike this government's Prime Minister. This is a glossy document that promises to get to net zero, but has no plan and no policy to get us all the way there. This is a plan, a glossy document, that promises that 100,000 jobs will be created, but again offers no policies and no plans to get that job done. Um, I asked the Department of Industry, Science, Energy and Resources about the government's net zero plan during the economics uh, committee hearings earlier this month, uh, and I asked about the 100,000 jobs that this government claims will be created in its glossy document. I asked when these jobs will come online. When can we expect to see them? Uh, and the response from the department was, and I quote, well, from the perspective of the 100,000 figure, that is a longer term projection. So when will we see these jobs? In five years? In 10 years? What is the government's plan? When will this government tell us how they are going to seize the global opportunities that are there right now to bring these jobs to Australia. The answer, of course, uh, is that we don't know because the government doesn't know. They have no plan, they have no vision, uh, and this government has had eight long years to figure it out. Uh, and time is running out because we have a leader who just 
doesn't know how to lead. We have a leader who is not prepared to get Australia into the global race. He is just not prepared to run the race himself. Uh, but what he is prepared to do is let the opportunities of the future simply pass him by and pass the rest of us by as well. This Prime Minister is just not up for the job. The Morrison government has had long enough to come up with a plan, and Australia can't afford to wait any longer. The next generation can't afford to wait any longer. The planet can't afford to wait any longer. And workers who need a plan for good, secure jobs from this government, they can't afford to wait any longer either. Australians don't want a government that thinks electric vehicles will end the weekend. They don't want a government that doesn't know how wind turbines work. They don't want a government that they can't trust to deliver the good, secure jobs for local communities. They want a government with vision. They want a government that brings our country together to win this global race. A government that grasps the opportunities of the future with both hands delivering the benefits to all Australians. Senator Walsh, your time has expired. Senator Macdonald. I rise to speak on this urgency motion that will no doubt be filled with breathless despair. No wonder children are worried about the future. By the time you've finished listening to the Greens and the opposition, you wonder why you'd even get out of bed tomorrow. Well, I am not filled with that same kind of despair because I know that the future in Australia and around the world is optimistic. And the reason why I know that is because of how Australia has performed over the last 10 years. Because it is in regional Australia where we grow the food, where we grow the fibre, where we mine the minerals. And by the way, all the renewable wind and, and solar projects are, and where you'll also have us make the batteries and produce hydrogen, all of the stuff that you don't want to see in the cities. That's where the action is in rural and regional Australia, and we are doing a pretty fine job without outrageous legislation, restrictions and government driving an agenda that will drive Australians into the ground. Because we have the benefit in this country of having an Australian plan, a particular plan that suits our climate conditions, our growing conditions. Our unique part of the world deserves a unique plan, and that is what the coalition has committed to. Not the UN's plan, not Greta Thunberg's plan. It is a plan developed in consultation with the very people who generate the wealth, the food, the fibre, the minerals and the renewable energies of this nation. It is realistic and it is based on Australia's minuscule contribution to world's emissions whilst the largest emitters continue uh, to go forth. Australia's emissions reductions uh, up to 2030 will be 28 per cent. That is, excluding, uh, that is including our export data. The EU, the EU, the great proponent of all things emissions reductions, has reduced less by 21 per cent. New Zealand has reduced by 4 per cent, and they exclude all of their agricultural industry. The UK, they have done well, down 34 per cent. The US, less than Australia, 13 per cent. At the same time, China has increased by 72 per cent, India by 86 per cent and South Korea by 33 per cent. So, Australia is doing more than its fair share in this space—28 per cent emissions reductions doing it our way, doing it with encouragement, with collaboration, letting market forces drive this space, letting farmers introduce new technology, letting manufacturing introduce new technology, and guess what? It is making them more money. They are more profitable. They are more productive and they are doing their bit for emissions reductions. And yet you won't hear that from the opposition. What you're going to hear about is taxes, fines, penalties, big sticks. Because of course you couldn't possibly rely on Australians to do the right thing without a forced compliance, according to the opposition and the Greens. We have committed to a plan that allows Australia 
to keep digging, to keep mining, to keep farming, to keep the lights on, because as of this point, fossil fuel still supplies 85 per cent of our baseline energy needs. And it has been done in a cleaner, uh, more controlled way every day because of technology. Because of technology. We, we have agreed to no caps on methane. And yet there is science that is going to deliver not just methane reduction through uh, feedlots and animal production, but will also increase the productivity of those herds and increase the amount of meat that we can grow. Because what is more important than growing food? Something that people in the cities can't do. Even the most, the most successful backyard veggie garden is not going to feed a family and we rely on our farmers to continue doing the job that they do, growing food and fibre not just for Australians but for a good part of our neighbours and the world around us. Industry leads the way and they do it because it's good for their business, they can maintain export markets, it's good for their profitability and it's good for the people who work for them, who have job security. Now, I want to touch on some of the implementation of renewable energy in Queensland. With the, the introduction of uh, rebates, renewable energy rebates, it increased the cost of electricity by $1 billion across the state. $1 billion. So that is every mum and dad and household who is paying for the change of new technology. Now, that is fine. That is part of the nation's objectives. But remember that in North Queensland, where I'm from, we pay three times the cost of electricity. Three times the cost of electricity to mine vanadium, to mine copper, to mine uh, uh, lithium and those products that are so necessary in the world economy. We pay three times the amount of insurance. And banks and finance institutions are increasing the rate of finance in that part of the world because of climate risk. But yet we are the part of the country that is going to solve the problem through the mining that we do, through the food and fibre that we grow uh, and the work that we are doing to reduce emissions. Because I don't see it happening in the cities. I don't see the changes in emissions reductions in the cities. And that's what regional and rural Australia is asking for. Uh, so I've touched on what some of the, the farmers are doing. I wanted to talk about um, the MLA's commitment to carbon neutral by 2030. Meatworks, which was always going to be the most challenging area. Uh, I spoke to a meat worker the other day who will go from a 64-tonne emitter to a 16-tonne sequester of carbon by next year. DIT Technologies is introducing technology to use uh, water-soluble uh, feed inputs. Uh, Four Seasons is doing the same. Uh, JCU has developed Asparagopsis, which is a, a, a methane-reducing but uh, productivity-increasing feed uh, for feedlots. So I hope that I've been able to give you a couple of examples of what Australian business is doing that doesn't require the big stick of legislation that the opposition and the Greens love to drive onto people. Because as part of our plan, we have no caps on methane. We have, uh, we're including soil carbon accounting. This is really exciting stuff for Australian producers. And we've also included a five-year review under the Productivity Commission to check in. What is the impact on our people? Because this is about people. This is about Australians who are doing the work in regional Australia, growing the food and fibre, doing the mining, transporting things around, uh, and uh, having the renewable fuel, uh, renewable energy stations, um, and growing and making batteries and all the other things that there is an expectation that they do. Uh, but it is these regions um, that are doing the heavy lifting, but they are going to have the biggest impact as well with the cost of electricity, the cost of insurance, and the cost of freight and travel. So it's very important that we keep looking back and seeing how they're doing. It is important that we stop talking about the broad issue of climate change and we start talking about measurables. So the Great Barrier Reef in my home state of Queensland 
Uh, we talk about reducing nitrogen and phosphorus. And now we have a market-based system for trading reductions in nitrogen and phosphorus runoff. A direct, a direct relationship between uh, an emitter or a, uh, a company that wants to buy uh, those reduced emissions of reduced uh, pollutants and the farmer who's doing that work. How terrific. David Littleproud, the Minister for Agriculture, yesterday announced a biodiversity trading platform. Again, a measurable way to understand what is actually happening in paddocks, uh, in regional and rural, and then benefit the people who are having to make the changes. I think that's incredibly positive. So I would say to you that we do not need taxes. We do not need big sticks and fines and penalties. What we need is encouragement. We need industry to drive this agenda because that will be good for Australia. It will be good for Australian businesses. It will be good for Australian jobs. And most importantly, it will be good for our people. Because us on this side, we care about people. We care about them still having a job. We care about them being able to afford to have a lifestyle. And whilst the Greens and Labor are worried about whether or not electric vehicles will mean you have a good weekend or not, we're ensuring that people can still afford to have a weekend. Thank you. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, I rise uh, uh, with only three minutes, so I really don't have time to do uh, justice uh, to the topic, so I'll restrict my comments to electric vehicles. It's been almost three years since the Prime Minister promised us an electric vehicle strategy. Instead, we've got a future fuel strategy, which states, and I quote, the government will continue to partner with industry to invest in enabling battery charging and hydrogen refuelling infrastructure for road transport to give Australian consumers and business confidence to purchase low emission vehicles that work for them. That's all we got. It fails to recognise that the way to give consumers and business confidence is to publish a policy which has objectives and which has timelines. We need to consider things like infrastructure, a national uh, EV charging network, for example. Now, we did see one of those go into the infrastructure plan in February 2019, where it's languished ever since, waiting to identify a proponent, let alone implementing it. Now, some progress has been made in relation to EV charging, but not because of some careful planning. Are fuel cell vehicles part of the solution? Well, if that's the case, we need to be talking about hydrogen refuelling stations. We need standards, we need codes, we need regulations for fuel and emissions uh, and for buildings. Now, having an electric charging point in apartment buildings, none of that's there. In terms of you know, vehicle type and investments, you know, the substantial difference between purchasing and depreciating a car compared to a train, and businesses must factor that in. So the, you know, the businesses need clear guidance. They've said that the current government strategy proposes changes. That's kind of a polite way of saying it's rubbish. The lack of national regulations leave consumers and industry subject to a patchwork of disparate regulations. It's like the rail um, gauge fiasco of, uh, of narrow standard and broad gauge radio. This is Australia's managing director was quite clear. He said, the most important role governments can play is to provide clear direction to the market on, the, uh, on, the sort, uh, on what the short, mid and long-term objectives uh, should be. This provides industry direction across auto, energy and infrastructure sectors, provides certainty for investment and, most importantly, provides clear direction to consumers. So industry and business are seeking stability. The Australian people are seeking clarity. Uh, yet we don't have that. Leaders are those that define the future, and we have an absence of leadership in relation to this government and electric vehicles. Senator Sheldon. I rise to speak on this urgency motion. Now, Australia has an obvious massive problem. We have a Prime Minister who will say absolutely anything to promote his own interests. He is shameless. He will leak private text messages of foreign leaders. He will disagree with what he, he himself has said. Just yesterday, 
He misled the House during question time about his holiday in Hawaii. And during the summer, of course, that holiday was taken during the Black Summer bushfires and was forced to walk that back almost immediately. He'll point blank deny saying things that he has said on national television. And a case in point is his absurd statement that electric vehicles will end the weekend, a statement he now denies even making. How can any Australian trust what comes out of this bloke's mouth? We also have a government that is absolutely squandering the job opportunity presented by the climate crisis. After eight years of infighting, after two Liberal Prime Ministers were rolled over climate policy, all this government has to show for is a glossy brochure Mr Morrison created so that he could show it off at Glasgow. And why? Because the government is too busy virtue signalling. Because Mr Morrison and members of this government are spending their time on stunts, like bringing in a lump of coal into parliament or smearing coal dust on their face and putting on a hard hat for a photo op. And it's all virtue signalling, pure and simple. Coal does have an ongoing role in the Australian economy for the foreseeable future. It has an important export and import important role for jobs. But if Mr Morrison cared even the slightest about jobs in the coal industry, then at some point in the last eight years, it would have stopped the labour hire rot that is destroying that industry. Here are the facts of the coal industry. In the 1990s, 94 per cent of people working on Queensland coal mines were employees of the mine operator. Today, more than half work for labour hire or other external contractors. BHP is the largest coal producer in Australia. BHP has told the Job Security Inquiry that across its coal mines nationwide, more than 70 per cent of people work for labour hire or external contractors. Just 29 per cent of people working at BHP coal mines are actual BHP employees. And even the Minerals Council of Australia admits that labour hire casuals earn 24 per cent less than direct employees doing the exact same job. At the Job Security Committee inquiry, we heard from a coal miner in central Queensland named Wayne Gulvich. He's one of the fortunate few that has, still has a direct job with the miner. But he said he hasn't had a new permanent employee join his team for seven years. Seven years of the company only hiring labour hire casuals and not hiring those same people as direct employees. This is disgraceful. Arthur Roris, the Secretary of the South Coast Labor Council, told us about the impact on miners in the Illawarra. He said, you've got a series of body hire firms now that essentially trade on being able to constantly undercut wage rates. We have workers who are sacked one day and rehired the next doing exactly the same job with less money and worse conditions. And has Mr Morrison done anything to stop this? No, of course not. Instead, Mr Morrison spent half a million taxpayer dollars defending the labour hire rort in the High Court. Instead, Mr Morrison passed a bill earlier this year that stripped rights away from casual labour hire mine workers. The fact is that while Mr Morrison brings a lump of coal into the parliament for a media stunt. He approves of billionaire mine owners using labour hire to slash workers' wages. Unlike Mr Morrison, Labor is fiercely opposed to this practice. That is why Anthony Albanese introduced the same job, same pay bill in the House yesterday. Mr Morrison is opposed to that bill because he isn't on the side Senator of mine Sheldon, workers. Senator Sheldon, your time has expired. Senator O'Sullivan. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise today to speak on another matter of urgency. Urgency. The most urgent agenda for the Labor Party while we are just starting to recover from the global pandemic, while the economy 
needs astute management while our borders are just starting to reopen and while the global security situation is perilous, the most urgent matter that Senator Urquhart and the Labor Party can dig up is comments made by the Prime Minister in 2019. What a farce. Really, it's embarrassing. embarrassing. They seem obsessed. Maybe that's why they're taking out ads on TikTok to attack him. An apparent alternative government. Wow. They really are taking the opportunity to deal with the big issues here today. For the record, neither the government nor I will be supporting this motion, of course. Uh, on the issue of climate and emissions, we have already delivered. We have delivered through technology and not taxes. We have delivered greater cuts to our emissions than we committed to under the 2030 target. We meet and beat and bet our 2020 target. We are forecast to reduce our emissions by up to 35 per cent on 2005 levels by 2030. And we are doing this with the, with the most consistently transparent reporting regime in the world. Now, this is in comparison to China, whose 2030 emissions reductions target is that they will only double their emissions based on 2005 levels. But in the urgency that we discuss here today, let's, let's get to it. We will not be legislating a 2050 target. We will not lock in a blank cheque with no way to achieve it. What would the Labor Party do if they legislated a 2050 net zero target in, an, uh, in 2048 and if it didn't look like it wasn't going to make it? Which industry would they shut down? How many new taxes would they raise to buy offsets? I'll leave that to the Labor Party to explain. But we on this side, we're not legislating this emissions target, but we will meet them consistently. We always do. We beat our 2020 target and we're on track to beat our 2030 target. The only time that an emissions target has been legislated in Australia is when Prime Minister Gillard, who would never have had a carbon tax under any government that she lead, did, did exactly that. She uh, led her government to a carbon tax. Madam Acting Deputy President, I think what really annoys those opposite the most is that we've actually set out a very credible plan to achieve our net zero emissions by 2050, while preserving, importantly, existing industries. We want to get down the cost of clean energy and low emissions technologies down. We want to get those costs down, not drive up the cost of meat and coal, uh, gas and oil and steel and aluminium and other energy and emissions intensive goods. We will take advantage of new economic opportunities, ensure our regions continue to prosper and establish Australia as a leader in new low emissions technologies like hydrogen. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'll touch on hydrogen for a moment because I believe it has a very big future for Australia. Blue and green hydrogen will both have their roles to play. And there's actually a myriad of colours if you look into it. There's, there's brown, there's pink, uh, uh, but really the colour doesn't really matter. If we can get proof of concept, then we have a basis for a global energy industry. And I'm proud to say that in my home state of Western Australia, government and industry are already working together at pace at pace to prove this concept. With the aid of $42.5 million grant from the Australian Government, Australian Renewable Energy Agency, uh, Yarra Pilbara and Engie will build a renewable hydrogen plant to produce renewable ammonia. Scheduled for completion in 2023, the facility will be one of the first, uh, world's first industrial scale renewable hydrogen production operations. The project will build upon Pilbara's renewable energy potential. We know that it's the, one of the sunniest and windiest places on the planet. And it, uh, this, this project is going to make a big difference up there for industry and indeed for that region. Uh, existing Yarra Pilbara ammonia plant will deliver green ammonia cu to customers for decarbonising emissions from power generation, shipping, fertiliser and mining explosives. I've toured Yarra, Yarra's current facility and I look forward to touring their new facility when it's up and running as well. The new facility will comprise a 10-megawatt electrolyzer. 
an on-site uh, facility of photovoltaic panels and battery storage system that will allow the plant to operate without being connected to the main electrical grid. The first phase of the project will produce up to 625 tonnes of renewable hydrogen and 3,700 tonnes of renewable ammonia per year. This initial first phase will be a key to enable the facility to become a keystone in the Pilbara Hydrogen Hub and will build upon the existing export infrastructure that's already there. It's projects like this that will get us to net zero, not Labor's burdensome regulations and taxes. Our policies and investments are enabling households and businesses to deploy new technologies. Why? Because it actually makes economic sense. The plan is based on our, econ on our existing policies and focuses on driving down technology costs and accelerating their development at scale across the economy. Our existing policies work, and so will our plan. Our existing policies also do not spell the end to traditional industries like coal or natural gas. Indeed, it recognises their importance. Now, it's such a shame that the member for Hunter, Mr Joel Fitzgibbon, is leaving the Labor benches because he was basically the only one on their side that uh, was an industrial elite realist. Now, just yesterday, we saw an announcement by Woodside and BHP that they will uh, move ahead with their Scarborough gas project. Fantastic. Fantastic which is also located in the Pilbara in Western Australia, a region that is genuinely the engine room of the Australian economy. If you haven't been there, you need to go there, Madam Deputy uh, President, and just have an acting Deputy President. You need to have a look at, what, at the scale of what is going on in that region. It certainly is the engine room. This project will see $16.5 in investment and create upwards of 3,200 jobs. And it's exactly this type of project and these jobs that will be under threat from a Labor government seeking to legislate a net zero position. Finally, I'll touch on the comments referenced in the urgency, urgency motion. Uh, now, I'm a fan of electric cars. I actually, uh, as soon as they're uh, more affordable, I reckon I'll be buying one. Uh, they're, they're very good, and I think there's an exciting prospect for them. Uh, but a, a, the fact is that there's, there's not a single electric car on the market that can tow a caravan. There isn't. Show it to me. It doesn't exist. Now, it's pretty true uh, that there, there are some emerging vehicles. There, there's the Rivian. I uh, challenge you to have a look at it. Uh, it looks like an exciting vehicle. But the reality is lithium-powered uh, battery vehicles, uh, they have a limited range. Uh, the, the vehicle's only so big and you can only put so much batteries in a vehicle. Now, a Rivian uh, is a dual cab ute. It can tow a large caravan. It can. But the reality is its range, without a load, is about 480 kilometres. As soon, anyone that has a caravan or a, or a boat, they'll tell you as soon as you put that load on the vehicle, it halves the range, even in a diesel vehicle. If a diesel vehicle's got a 500 kilometre range, you, you, put a, you, you put a boat on it or a caravan on it, and it significantly reduces it, more than half, more than half. Now, anyone with a caravan and boat, they'll tell you that. Now, this, the same is true for an EV. This vehicle has got the capability to tow it, but it will only be able to tow it about 240 kilometres. And with the battery in that, which is a 135 kilowatt hour battery, that will take about six hours to load up. Now, fair enough, if you've got a caravan towed behind you, I suppose you could always pull over and have a bit of a kip for six hours every two and a bit hours. You could go and do that, but let's face it, it's not practical. Now, hydrogen provides a future, but that's many years off. Hydrogen fuel cell vehicles may be the way to go in the future. Now, as soon as these vehicles become cheaper and more affordable and accessible, I've got no doubt that Australians will actively choose to buy an EV. And it suits small scale, it suits uh, commuter vehicles, driving around town, daily driver sort of vehicles. That's fine. I think Australians will make that choice for themselves. But this motion is emblematic of the modern Labor Party. They clutch at green straws while dodging the real issues of the day, seeking to legislate and regulate their worldview on Australians. They're going to force these vehicles off the road. Well, we want Australians to have choice. Choice. That's what it's about. It's a long way off before you're going to be able to hitch up your caravan and your boat behind an EV. Let's face it, if you can show me a vehicle that can do it, you know what, I might even go and buy one myself. Uh, Senator Ciccone. 
Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, and look, with its latest glossy document, the Morrison Joyce government claimed to have a plan to address climate change and achieve net zero carbon emissions by 2050. But the reality is this lightweight pamphlet did little to explore the real world impacts of, its, of this target. Like always, the coalition have refused to take responsibility and pass the buck. Fortunately, the Centre of Policy Studies at Victoria University recently published a paper titled Zero Greenhouse Gas Emissions by 2050, what it means for the Australian economy, industries and regions. After reading through the marketing materials the coalition government called a plan, it's great to see some research that actually explores the real-world effects of achieving net zero by 2050. The paper dives deeply into several areas, but today I want to particularly focus on what net zero means for Australia's timber industry. This is an industry that is very close to my heart. For a long time, a job in the timber industry has meant decent pay, good conditions and reliable work. The sort of job you can depend on as you build a life, buy a house and raise a family. Now, it's heartening to see that the research predicts that by pursuing net zero by 2050, our forestry industry will be almost twice the size than if we did not take action on climate change. Sustainable forestry is essential to achieving net zero, as demonstrated by this important research. However, the Morrison-Joyce government's own summary barely mentioned forestry or wood processing. By treating net zero as a political problem rather than an economic opportunity, the coalition is overlooking the impact its decisions will have on industries and workers. Under the Liberals and Nationals, Australia's plantation estate has shrunk by 500 million trees, down 10 per cent since 2014. This must change if we are going to achieve net zero by 2050. The research also demonstrates, demonstrates the foolishness of those who seek to damage our forestry industry in the name of climate change. The paper shows that the forestry industry, as our greenest form of carbon capture, will need to grow to meet our targets. Those that seek to damage or disrupt the activities of our timber workers are not only hurting the livelihoods of working families and regional communities, they are also making it harder for us to hit our climate goals. Tree plantations in Victoria store 8.4 million tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. It is wrong to attack this industry when its work is essential to limiting climate change. We cannot afford to be distracted by some radicals more concerned with making themselves feel good than protecting our planet. And I back our timber workers, and so does the research by Victoria University. The real climate heroes are providing sustainable, green building materials to our construction industry. They are taking and storing carbon from our forests and regrowing the harvested trees to store even more carbon. They are working in an industry that provides good jobs and the foundation of local economies right around Australia and in regional Australia, an industry that needs to be supported to expand if we are going to meet our targets. The Morrison-Joyce government needs to understand that leadership isn't just waving a brochure around at a press conference. Leadership is assessing the impact of your decisions on the Australian economy, so we can help those who will need a leg up and create jobs right here in Australia. Activists need to understand that attacking the timber industry is not going to prevent climate change. You are targeting an industry that needs to get bigger, not smaller, to protect our planet. We cannot be tricked into believing that we need to choose between jobs and the environment. And the research from the Centre of Policy Studies confirms that this is a false choice. And I look forward to continuing to support the timber workers and their communities because Federal Labor is on their side, Madam Acting Deputy President. Uh, Senator Bragg. Look, thanks very much for that. And uh, it's uh, terrific to be able to have an opportunity to make some remarks about this matter of public urgency um, in relation to climate change, climate risk, 
And uh, look, I, my view has been that we can all win from getting to net zero. I'm not so big on the um, the, the slogans and whatnot, but I, I do think that uh, we are on the right track with this policy. Um, I, I mean, the, it's important to point out here that I mean, this this is about getting to net zero. It's not about getting to zero. So there there will still be uh, emissions. Um, Agriculture, transport, in particular, um, but in the long run, I mean, it's possible that you could get beyond net zero. I mean, you could become an exporter of carbon abatement services uh, for people that have visited uh, far-flung parts of New South Wales, in particular. People would be aware that there is a lot of uh, land which could be put to good use in terms of offsetting. Uh, carbon, uh, and a lot of the people that live in these areas are, are low-income people, and uh, that could be a whole new uh, revenue stream uh, for these people. So, uh, the reality is that Australia has never had enough capital to fund itself. We have relied upon foreign investment for the past 250 years, and that will always be the case. Um, and even under the superannuation system. Uh, we are still very, very heavy, heavily reliant upon foreign capital. And, and the people that uh, are against foreign investment are often city slickers, uh, and they often fail to recognise that uh, the major foreign investment that is required to deliver this transition, a large part of that will go into the regions. Um, and if you want to have offshore wind, and you want to have pumped hydro, and you want to have these new forms of um, energy, energy generation, uh, which is, in many cases, heavy industry uh, and high-paying jobs, uh, you need a lot of money. You need a lot of money. So sending the, the right signals to the capital markets was always going to be an essential part of getting to net zero. Um, I, I'm very cognizant of this, the point that people make that if you close down uh, coal, uh, you can't replace those jobs with the handful of people that work at a solar farm. I think that's a valid argument. So, uh, if you want to replace, if you want to have a plan for uh, heavy industry jobs, uh, it is going to be on things like offshore wind. Um, I do think we should look at nuclear as well. Um, I've never understood, I've never understood why we would take any any form of technology off the table. I think there is way too much ideology in this area. Uh, and as a person that has tried to focus their public contributions on economic policy, uh, I would say that this is a major economic policy opportunity for the country, but it's also a huge risk if we get it wrong. So uh, global, global capital markets, for better or worse, have made up their mind on a lot of these key questions, uh, and we need to make sure that this is a sensible transition. Now, we don't know how successful hydrogen will be, uh, but we do need to put as much time and energy into this as we, as we can. Um, the other point I make here is that um, I, I don't believe in uh, overly bureaucratic measures. And I don't think that putting all this into legislation is the, is the right answer. I don't think we should be outsourcing these judgments to bureaucrats, uh, just like I don't think we should be outsourcing our judgments to the Reserve Bank. Uh, I think that we are in a situation where there is too much independence that is centred outside of the elected parliament uh, and that ultimately parliaments and governments are responsible for these judgments and should stand up and seek election or seek re-election on that basis. And so I don't support uh, legislating things and uh, creating new bureaucracies in this space. I think what we have put out is a reasonable plan uh, and it is a, a plan that I think will most heavily benefit the regions, which is where the main pain points will be. They will be in the regions. Senator Roberts. Senator Thank you, Roberts. Madam Acting. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. Contradictions erupt and abound in climate and energy policies because no politician has ever provided the logical scientific points as evidence. 
John Howard's government introduced the renewable energy target and stole farmers' property rights to use their property. Yet six years after being booted from office, he confessed in London in 2013 that on climate science, he's agnostic. He had no science to support what has become the gutting of our electricity sector and our productive capacity. In 2016, the father of the Senate, Ian MacDonald, said there has never been a debate on the climate science, and he's correct. Two months ago, 10 federal politicians confirmed in writing to me that they have never, provided, never been provided with this scientific evidence. I'll name those people if there's time. They show integrity and courage. In August last year, 19 federal politicians advocating climate alarm and climate policies failed to provide me with the scientific evidence. I'll name them too. In 2007 and 2008, Kevin Rudd claimed 4,000 scientists support the claim that carbon dioxide from human activity affects climate and needs to be cut. The UN's climate body's own data shows only five endorsed the claim, and there's doubt they were even scientists. Matthias Cormann, instead of providing evidence as requested on many times, says, quote, we must meet global obligations. To the same organizations that Prime Minister Morrison rightly describes as, quote, unelected international bureaucrats. My own freedom of information requests and the parliamentary library searches show no evidence has ever been given to members of parliament, Senate and House of Reps requiring these policies. Yet both the Labor Greens coalition and the Liberal National coalition have climate and energy policies not based on empirical scientific evidence. Come clean with the people of Australia. Unshackle our nation. Give the people a go. Restore freedom. Senator Marielle Smith. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. My home state of South Australia should not have to endure this government's failure on climate policy any longer, because their failure is costing my state. It's costing our environment. It's costing us in terms of the River Murray. It's costing us in terms of investment. It's costing us in terms of jobs, and it is costing our children a prosperous future. Their failure on leadership, on climate change, is a failure of the highest order. And instead of readying our country to take advantage of the economic opportunities of a renewable energy revolution, they have done what they do best, stoke fear, inflame division, mislead the Australian people on what is to come. And we have seen this time and time again from the Liberals. Like when the Prime Minister said, that low emissions technology, like electoral vehicles, will end the weekend. And we've seen it in the Prime Minister's embarrassing performance in Glasgow. Their failures on climate change policy have robbed Australians, and they have especially robbed those Australians who have the most to lose from a changing climate. South Australians will not be taken for fools. They see it, they get it. And while people have rightfully been focused on the pandemic for the past two years, beyond that, the one issue raised with me more than any other is the need for urgent action on climate change. South Australians want action on climate change because they know the environmental and economic future of our state depends on national leadership, on national action. But instead, under this government, they've had 21 different energy policies under three prime ministers just recently another glossy document, a pamphlet with no detail, a pamphlet, an embarrassment on the world stage where Australia should be leading, where we are capable of leading. And rather than in increasing our ambition on tackling climate change, rather than being leaders, every time, every time we get here, they're dragged kicking and screaming. This is of the utmost importance to my state. People in my state have seen the impacts of climate change firsthand, the black summer fires. And we know fires, bushfires predicted to increase in intensity and frequency. And we know, we know that if more action isn't taken to enhance and promote renewable energy, we'll see power prices going up. South Australians, my constituents, they want to know why this federal government isn't seizing the opportunities to produce more cheap, reliable, renewable energy, why they aren't taking advantage of this revolution. By investing more in our renewable energy sector, we create jobs, 
We drive down power prices. We deliver South Australians a better future. And South Australians, I can tell you, they inherently understand what the coalition simply cannot grasp. Meaningful action on climate change is critical for our environmental future, but also for our economic future, for the future of our children, for their future prosperity. And their inaction, it makes me angry, and I know it makes South Australians angry, because they just can't grasp how important it is. There are huge opportunities for my state in South Australia if Australia is to lead, if Australia is to lead and deliver the jobs and the growth which we know a green energy revolution can deliver. And we see this leadership from the state opposition in my state, from Peter Malinowskis and his team, with their plans to build a 200 megawatt clean energy hydrogen power plant and storage facility. We've seen it from parts of the private sector who have driven investment in this space, not helped by the policy settings of the federal government, but more and more seeing the light, seeing the economic opportunity, taking that leadership where the federal government will not. State governments stepping up to lead on climate policy where the federal government will not, where the federal government, where the federal Liberals have just divided ignited fear, sought to disrupt and destroy any meaningful effort to tackle climate change. And my state risks being left behind unless they get their act together. Our country risks being left behind unless they get their act together. South Australians know how urgent this is, and they want the federal government to recognise that too. Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy. President, I stand in this place as a proud Gunai Gunditjmara Japarung woman. Our people thrived on this continent for tens of thousands of years, and we are the oldest continuing living culture on the planet. Everything on country, the water, the air, the sky, the animals, our totems, carries the memories of our ancestors and the stories and lore of our elders. We have cared for everything from the roots of the grasses to the leaves of the highest trees and every living being that relies on them for thousands of years. Just to be destroyed in 250 years of colonisation, bang, wiped out, the dispossession desecration and destruction of country, the pollution of our waters, the theft of our homelands. These stories are not unique to our people in this continent. We heard COP27 from First Nations people from around the world who told the same stories of dispossession desecration and destruction. Climate change is simply a failure of First Nations participation and empowerment, and your failure, your failure, because we didn't fail this country. The reason why our ecosystems are collapsing is because you failed to hear us. You failed to care about the things that mattered, and you failed our ancestors and their stories. Senator Faruqi. Thank you, Madam Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to the matter of urgency in front of us. Just today, we have received news that Sergio, a 22-year-old climate activist in New South Wales, has been senten sentenced to 12 months in prison for participating in a non-violent direct action targeting the coal industry. 12 months in prison. What an outrageously severe and disproportionate punishment. What an appalling message this sends to climate activists and those of us who are fighting for a healthy planet. The real criminals are the fossil fuel companies who are killing our planet, not those who are trying to save it. The Morrison government, they are the real criminals who refuse to tackle the climate crisis, not those who want a future 
for all of us. The real criminals are running amok, spruiking dirty coal and gas. They are the ones con condemning us to catastrophic climate change. Australia's insatiable appetite for coal and gas is bringing our Pacific neighbours even closer to the climate precipice. Yet, Scott Morrison refuses to act. I can't say I'm surprised. This is someone who brought a lump of coal in Parliament. This is a Prime Minister who was dragged kicking and screaming to Glasgow, where Australia actively sabotaged climate action. I am angry that we have a Prime Minister who is happy waving around a glossy pamphlet with a pathetic policy, which is more of a plan to fuel the climate crisis rather than tackle it. And I am furious that we still have a government ideologically rooted in colonial power, hell-bent on destroying nature, and greedy for accumulating resources and wealth by hook or by crook. We know the Liberals are pathetic on climate justice, but if Labour really cares about climate change, then they should join the Greens and offer a bolder alternative vision. They should commit to a 75% reduction in emissions by 2030. They should join us in stopping the dodgy climate-destroying project in the Beetaloo Basin to prioritize the concerns of First Nations communities because we will not have climate justice without First Nations justice. Anything less is mere theater. But change will come, and it will come from the people. They know we must quit coal and gas. They know the Beetaloo Basin and Scarborough gas projects are ticking climate bombs. They know the Morrison government must be kicked out. And they know that the Greens in shared power will push Labour further and faster. Thank you. The question is that the motion be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. aye. Those against say no. no. I think the ayes have it. No, have it. Division required? Ring the bells.
stop the bells. I will, however, give the whips a few moments, as all senators understand. Pairing arrangements are complex at the moment. The question is that the urgency motion be agreed to. Ayes will pass to the right of the chair, noes to the left. I appoint Senator Ciccone, teller for the ayes, and Senator Davey, teller for the noes. There being 22 ayes and 20 noes, the question is resolved in the affirmative. I'll just give senators a moment to resume their seats.